in five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Sir, we are live now. Hello. Good evening. This is Dr. Sandeep Patwardhan, Secretary, Pediatric Orthopedic Society, along with Dr. Deeran Ganjwala. We welcome you to this webinar, which uh, boasts of faculty from USA, Chennai, and Mumbai. We have Dr. Mihir Thakur, who is a renowned onco orthopedic surgeon and a pediatric orthopedic surgeon practicing at uh, uh, in uh, the uh, Children's Hospital at Alfred DuPont uh, at Delaware. And we have Dr. Vijay Sriram from Chennai, who's our very own uh, pediatric orthopedic surgeon, and Dr. Sandeep Vaidya from Mumbai. Uh, all these stalwarts today are here to discuss a very interesting condition, multiple exostosis or osteochondromas and their problems and complications that arise from that. And I welcome everybody for this webinar. And I would like to start off with the talk by Dr. Meir Thakur. Thank you very much, Sandeep, for that uh, lovely introduction. And, uh, you know, it is a great pleasure for me to be here amongst old friends and some new friends, which hopefully we will make today. Um, there, COVID, I think, is what sparked us off on this journey with, uh, the, multi uh, with the webinars here. And I remember when we were at the height of COVID, we had started with these and I was on one of the early webinars and it is just a pleasure to be back again. So without further ado, we are going to go over some of the aspects of multiple osteochondromatosis and some of the challenges that we might run into and some of the more controversial areas. So this is a condition that is quite common and most of us as pediatric orthopedic surgeons are very likely to see at least one, if not several patients with multiple osteochondromas or exostoses. The prevalence is roughly one per 50,000. And with the population of India growing exponentially, I think there are a lot more that you guys will see over there. Um, although I have the luxury and the pleasure of following probably about a hundred odd kids and maybe another 30-ish adults with multiple osteochondromatosis. So as we know, it's an autosomal dominant trait, and it is not every single time that you have a family history, about 20 to 30% of them are new mutations. But when you look at the genetics, you have two major culprits. One is the EXT1 and one is the EXT2. The EXT1 is by far the worst both phenotypically and also from a malignant transformation risk, and we'll go over that. So these two mutations account for roughly about 90% of MHE kids. Now, what is sometimes asked by the family is when they have multiple kids with osteochondromas or when they are pregnant with the next one coming in, is, is this going to be similar to my older child? And the answer is we really don't know, because even within the same family, the expression phenotypically is quite variable. Most of them tend to present in the mid first decade. Because prior to that, the osteochondromas are small and not easily palpable. Now, if you have a family history and the family is sensitized to them, then they will probably pick them up sooner. Clearly the ones that present earlier on are the ones that are gonna be more affected. So that is something to keep in mind. And just having multiple osteochondromas doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna be MHG. There are a few other conditions that you also need to think about, namely trichorhinophalangeal syndrome type two, pataki schaefer syndrome, both of which are pretty uncommon. So, you know, if you see someone with multiple osteochondromas, more than likely you're gonna be dealing with a regular MHG patient rather than one of these more unusual syndromic patients, but certainly keep those things in mind. The other condition, that also will give you multiple osteochondroma sometimes is when you have kids who receive full body radiation for um, CNS malignancies or marrow-based malignancies early on. They can also develop osteochondromas in the radiation field. So that's something to keep in mind. And those 
potentially can misbehave down the road. So certainly a subgroup to be a little bit more careful with. Why? Because we know that this is a pre-malignant condition, right? Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to go over some of these cases with MHE and go over certain case examples, go over different body parts and look at some of the controversial areas, some of the challenges, some of the principles, and then hopefully get into a nice discussion. So I will not bore you with the genetics in too much detail, but the reason why I put this slide up is because we were quite excited a couple of years ago with this trial. And this was a trial for a drug called paloverotin, which is something that is used in FOP and it inhibits bone formation, but it also inhibits cartilage growth by decreasing the BMP signaling, which is abnormal in these kids with MHC. Unfortunately, with this, it also seems to inhibit the growth of normal physeal cartilage. So the trial was stopped due to premature closure of growth plates. And at this time, we really don't have much more information. So more hopefully to follow at some point down the road with medical management. So for right now, it's us basically treating this disease surgically. So let's go into some of these cases. So there's a patient. This is probably one of the youngest kids with MHE that I have seen. This is a child who is being worked up for his liver enzymes. They had done some routine lab work and found that his liver enzymes were elevated. And they got an ultrasound and then a CAT scan of the abdomen. And what you can see on the left side of the screen is a big osteochondroma in a little one and a half year old. So this was indenting his liver, as you can see on the image to the right. And when we went in and took it out, we had a nice big indentation there, which, you know, the liver recovers. So that's not a problem, but this was what was causing his elevated liver enzymes. And he has since gone on to develop several, several other osteochondromas and is probably amongst one of the worst affected that I follow. So again, point being, if they present early, then it is quite likely that we're gonna deal with someone with a more severe disease. Now, when we see these kids, what is our initial workup? It is quite variable. I don't think that there is anything that has been established as what a standard workup needs to be whether or not you need to get a skeletal survey or you just do focused imaging of the symptomatic areas. I typically will prefer to get at the very least a full lower extremity film to look at my alignment at baseline and get a sense of what the lower extremity involvement is because that is usually the biggest source of uh, morbidity in these patients. And then clinically look at everything else and if there's any other parts that need to be evaluated, we will get those as well. Um, some people get a skeletal survey routinely, and uh, as long as you're not overly radiating uh, people on a regular basis, I think that's perfectly reasonable to establish baseline as well. So we'll quickly go through the spine and then go into the meat of the topic, which is going to be the lower extremity. So this is a child with uh, MHE, known diagnosis, has multiple extremity involvement, and comes in with back pain. It's thoracic back pain and neurologically he's completely intact. We image him and we see a fairly large osteochondroma arising from the posterior elements of his upper thoracic spine. And treatment for that is pretty straightforward. You go in and you take it out and because it involves the facet, we end up with a segmental instrumentation fusion over a limited segment. So that is pretty straightforward. How about this one? This is a 14 year old that again, known case of MHE has had multiple prior surgical procedures. This is someone that I'd seen a long time ago now, but this is a case that sticks to my mind because of how striking it was. So she was actually referred to me by one of my senior partners for leg pains. And they said, okay, you know, you're the new guy you might as well take some of these osteochondromas out and take over the care of this patient. So in talking to the patient, it looks like she has mostly muscle cramp-like pains. 
And it's not very well localized over any of the osteopenic romas. And then when I did a neurologic exam, she had a Babinski and wrist tendon reflexes, both in the upper and the lower extremities, which then certainly raises a lot of red flags. So what we did was we imaged the spine and what you see, it's hard to see on the plane films, but if you look carefully, there is maybe a hint of something happening at the top of the C-spine, but this is not at all subtle when you look at the CT scan. And you can see that there is a large osteochondroma arising from the posterior elements of C2 completely in the canal and leaving very little room for the cord that's been pushed to the site. So these are dangerous. These are dangerous because obviously over time, as they grow, they can cause spinal cord compression. And these are also dangerous because, you know, if they have any kind of a whiplash type of injury, there's very, very little tolerance that the cord has to be able to survive those. And there have been reports of sudden paraparesis, quadriparesis, or even sudden death because of these intraspinal osteochondromas with relatively trivial trauma. So these we take very seriously. All right. So what we did for her was we went in and we excised it and you can see how the spinal cord is indented by that large osteochondroma. And fortunately, we did not have to resect the facets and she did fine without any kind of fusion. But if you need to fuse it, so be it. And this is something that we published a long time ago. So very, very important for us to keep those in mind. So what are the controversial areas? Who do we screen? Do we universally screen every child with MHE? Are there any harbinger lesions or lesions that would point us to screening more diligently? When do we screen? How frequently do we screen? How do we screen? Is it just clinical or do we MRI everybody? And if we find something, how do we monitor this? And these areas remain somewhat controversial. Jim Roach in his landmark 2009 paper really brought this to light where he had 44 patients, almost 70% with spine involvement and almost a quarter with canal compromise. That's a lot. And you know, when we look at some of the subsequent studies, that really hasn't been found to be the case. And he is in Salt Lake City, Utah, which is a little bit of a clustered population. So that may have something to do with genetics more so than anything else, but roughly five to maybe 10% of the MHG population will have intraspinal osteochondromas. Now, one of the better papers that we've had is one from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia with Alex Arcader as the senior author. And they basically reported that experience on over 200 patients. Roughly 10% of them had spine imaging because of symptoms and roughly a third of those had spine lesions. So if you look at the big cohort, maybe about 3.5% of the big cohort that had symptomatic spine lesions. And that is, you know, a decent number. It's certainly not the 27% that Jim Roach found in his population, but we also have to recognize that not everybody was imaged. And some of these can be silent and asymptomatic. What they did find, which is quite useful, was if they looked at the kids who had rib and pelvic osteochondromas, that was a good indicator for them to image the spine. So all the ones that had the spine osteochondromas had pelvic osteochondromas and rib osteochondromas. And having those two gave them about 70% specificity as far as the spine is concerned. So that's something that you can keep in mind and something that is actionable. What we do see is the C-spine is the most common, C2 is the most commonly involved level. These are slow growing, the progression is variable. And like I said, they may be asymptomatic. So you really have to be on your guard. And there are no universal protocols. Uh, Steve Frick did a survey on several so-called experts on multiple osteochondromas, and they found that there was not really any agreement even within the experts about when to image, how to image, how frequently to image. So what do I do? I certainly get a pretty careful history 
and do a neurologic exam in all these people at all their visits. You ask for occipital headaches because of course there are element involvement at C2, neck pain, back pain, any kind of tingling or numbness or weakness or bladder bowel changes or changes in their gait and that heightens our levels of suspicion. And then with the neurologic exam, make sure that we do a good thorough exam, check their abdominals, check their plantars and do everything else. And that then, and also check their range of motion. And if there's any limitation there, then that certainly prompts an MRI. And once we find these, we do tend to follow them usually annually or every other year. And more so around growth spurts, sometimes we'll stretch them out if they're close to maturity. So that's the spine. And then we'll move on quickly to the lower extremity. So as we know, the lower extremity is a major source of disability. They can cause pain, there can be deformities and neurovascular compromise. Going through the hip, what we do know is, you know, there is some degree of hip dysplasia. The question is, does everybody get it? Or does that, is there any kind of guide to when to intervene, how to intervene? We also know that impingement is quite common, but what's the best way to address that? And then we'll go over some of the interventions. So this is our paper in 2018. We looked at uh, about 102 hips with MHE and we found that hip involvement is quite common. Most of them have it. And it's usually pain and limited range of motion. Oxavalga, femoral antiversion are quite common. Astabular dysplasia, uh, not so much. And FAI, certainly there. What we also found is as we followed some of these kids, we did find that there was improvement in the parameters over time. So there is no rush to really operate on these kids. And there's another paper out of Japan where they looked at adults with MHE and did not find any major prevalence of acetabular dysplasia. So we may want to hold off on aggressive intervention for that. So here's an example, 12 year old with MHE, bilateral hip pain, mechanical symptoms, very, very typical radiograph. You see lots of involvement around the lesser trochanter and the medial calcar, coxa valga, the acetabuli don't look too bad. And then on the frog, you can see there's involvement both in the front and in the back. So we always want to look at the overall alignment, make sure that there's not anything else that we need to be thinking about there. And because of the symptoms, she gets an MRI. And what we see is a paralabral cyst you see osteochondroma circumferentially around the neck and the labrum looks pretty unhappy because it's been crushed by these osteochondromas. So what do you do in that situation? Typically, what people have done is uh, surgical hip dislocations, which is an excellent way to visualize the hip and address these several different components to their impingement that they have. And looking at some of the published results, this is out of the Bone and Joint Journal by Sorel et al. And they had 20 hips, but they had four out of the 20, which is 20% major complications, two trochanteric osteotomy issues, one fracture, and one AVN. Those are significant. So what can we do to make life easier from that perspective? So what we did for this young lady, and what we've done for several kids now, is a surgical hip dislocation approach, get in there. As you get in, you do have to be careful with the antiversion because that throws off some of the trochanteric osteotomy angle that you have to take at. So we'll go over that in a second. The fact that they're extremely antiverted sometimes can make dislocation a little bit harder. If they're dysplastic, then that makes dislocation a little bit easier. So you really have to see where you are but you may have to really work on getting that hip adducted and externally rotated to be able to dislocate the hip. With the approach, it's also extremely important to make sure that you free that sciatic nerve up all the way up to the greater sciatic notch, or at least you know, see, make sure it's not tethered, look at the piriformis, see if it's splitting of the piriformis or if there's anything as far as osteochondromas that are pushing on the nerve. Because oftentimes, the nerve is also tethered distally, mostly around the proximal dip fib area. And you can sometimes end up with a nerve issue as you dislocate the hip and stretch that sciatic nerve. So watch out for that. 
So what we did was when we got in there, we were able to almost circumferentially excise these osteochondromas. You all always need to be careful about the retinaculum. Um, but you oftentimes end up taking all of that medial calcar because that's where the bulk of the osteochondromas are. And you have to look out for that ligament of white tract, which often will get compromised and you will lose some of that blood flow, which is why the retinacular blood flow is super important and handling that retinaculum safely is also super important. So once you do that, you can actually look inside the hip and you can see a big degenerative labrum and a labral tear extending into the cartilage there. So that then gets repaired. And because we've taken the calcar, we do, I, I will routinely put a screw inside plate to support the calcar. And if you look at her, she's very interesting because even though we did that and there was no osteotomy, at her follow-up, you can see that there is a break in the distal most screw. So that gives you a sense of how much bending stress there is through that calcar that has been resected and even more reason for us to make sure that you don't just put in a screw in here because that is not going to be enough. You do need a side plate, whether you use a blade plate or use a locking plate, that's entirely up to you, okay? And then you recreate that offset nicely, make sure that you've taken away all the offending osteochondromas. Um, Ischiofemoral impingement is also quite common. And this is another paper that we published also in 2018, where we had um, almost half of them with ischiofemoral impingement. And they usually will have osteochondromas around the lesser stroke and also around the ischium. So those would need to be addressed at the time of intervention. So here's another patient. This is a young one. He's only seven and a half, again, with extensive involvement of that medial calcar and also all around the neck. And sometimes, you know, when you look at this, it's really hard to figure out where is the superior neck and where is the inferior neck. So how do you really measure your neck shaft angle accurately? It's hard sometimes, right? If you have a clear cut neck, then it's much easier. But when they have circumferential involvement, it looks like there is extreme pots of alga, but we really don't know because the osteochondroma is masking some of the anatomy. So again, MR arthrogram, similar thing. You can see an extensive labral degenerative tear and same thing as you go in. Now, this is one where we did go in and we did make a little error in the angle of our osteotomy. And you can see there's a little bit of a nozellus osteotomy that extends into the anterior neck. So you really do need to be careful with these. And you know, the whole purpose behind showing you this is even in experienced hands, sometimes if you're not careful, then you can run into these issues. So repaired the labrum, took out his osteochondromas, and there he is, and he subsequently had the other side done. So you can see him before, and that is him after. So you can see how limited their um, ability to sit cross-legged is, which is important in, especially in the Indian situation, right? So the valgus and antiversion are very common and you can have significant limitation in external rotation. So sometimes you will add a little bit of varus and a derotation osteotomy, which I think has been something that I've started doing much more so because even putting socks on without being able to externally rotate is extremely hard. So there's an example. We added a touch of varus, as you can see there, and the hip is nicely covered. And we also did a subtroke derotation for her in addition to resecting all of her osteochondromas and repairing the labrum. So as far as the hip is concerned, frequent involvement, and you do see some improvement in the radiographic parameters. So it's perfectly fine to wait and not rush in. Use the plate and screws, Otherwise you run the risk of a femoral neck fracture. The sciatic nerve needs to be dealt with carefully and consider a derotational femoral osteotomy if there is significant limitation of external rotation. Pelvic osteotomies, at least in my hands, are rare in this situation, but if you need to, then you can certainly go ahead and add a pelvic procedure if the virus by itself is not enough. Going on to the knee, 
While this deformity is a common, typically treated with hemiopsisidesis, the controversy here is do we need to excise the tethering ostical dermis in the proximal tip-fib area or not? And how do we manage the peroneal nerve issues that we see frequently in the proximal fibula? So with neosteochondromas, this is probably one of the most common sites. And depending on where the osteochondromas are, they will impinge on soft tissues. The most symptomatic site is usually the proximal medial tibia with the best ancillinus tendons being affected. The IT band can also be affected. And if there is a large posterior lateral, usually osteochondroma, then you end up with a little limitation in flexion. From a bony alignment perspective, they can have sagittal plane abnormalities in the distal femur, but those are rarely symptomatic. They usually end up with genuvalgum, more so than verum, although you can certainly get genuvalgum as well. So for large symptomatic osteochondromas, they do need to be excised. The proximal tibiofibular area is a particularly challenging one, and uh, you may need to approach this with more than one surgical approach. So you may want to do like a posterolateral approach plus an anterior approach as well to safely get things um, out of the way for you to be able to resect them. Here you can see there are osteochondromas in the back and there's the vessels right up against the back of the knee. It's a hard spot to get to, but if you need to, you need to be able to do it safely. And yeah, you can see some of the wires that we use for your monitoring, and we'll get into that momentarily. So growth modulation, standard pediatric principle, nothing new, nothing exciting here. Uh, do your standard deformity analysis, and then do the tension band plate on whatever bone is the biggest culprit. And sometimes we'll do things like this, where if you have asymmetric genuvalgum, I'll put in a regular eight plate on the one side and then more of the H plate or I plate on the other side to try and get things corrected a little bit sooner on that side. And that seems to work. So there's an example, typical genuvalgum, tension band plates. You can also see the medium mild screws, which we'll talk about momentarily. Once it corrects, we take them out and follow them along. Sometimes you need to redo them if you've had to do them early, All right? Talking about the peroneal nerve, uh, this is obviously a bit of a challenge. And there's a report out in 2018 by the group from Texas Scottish Rite where they reported their experience and they found quite a few with a peroneal nerve issue and really almost a little more than 20% who are normal pre-op developed a first up foot drop. Three resolved, one improved, but one had a completely lacerated peroneal nerve that really never want to be in this situation. Um, you know, the very first proximal fibular osteochondroma that I did, I did run into a little bit of a problem. This is now going back, you know, 17 years or whatever. And we came up with the idea of using neuromonitoring because we wanted to make it a safer procedure. And with neuromonitoring, we really have improved our safety. And what we found is there is a high, more than a third will have intraoperative alerts. And that gives you the opportunity to be able to change what you're doing and intervene in a timely fashion. And with that, we've really had no motor deficits postoperatively, despite having, you know, you can see the osteochondroma in that uh, picture clinically up uh, at the top of the screen. Those are some pretty gnarly large osteochondromas and we've managed to keep them safe with this approach. Um, vascular compromise can also obviously happen. This is a patient of mine uh, that we've seen recently who had a large few osteochondromas at the back of the knee, right by the trifurcation. And on the angio, you can see the asymmetry there. You can see the partial blockade there. So those are things that you need to be aware of. Check the pulses, do all of that good stuff like you always do. And those might be challenging areas that may need extensile approaches, maybe the help of a friend who's a vascular colleague to help out with some of these. Okay. Going on to the ankle. Um, again, valgus deformity is much more common. What is the role of hemiopathicidesis? Is that enough? And when do we do those? And then are there any other things that we can do? So we'll go over those. Looking at the natural history, we know based on this paper from Ken Noonan that 
roughly about half of the MHE patients will have significant ankle involvement. They looked at um, adults average age about 42, and they had about 10 degrees of ankle valgus. 20% of them already had arthritis, and almost half of them had limitation in their activities because of pain. So this is a big deal, and you really don't want to leave the ankle in valgus. We know that that is the joint that takes the maximum load per unit area in the entire human body, and it really does not tolerate malalignment very well. So this is something that we've gotten a lot more aggressive with, and we'll go over uh, my approach in just a little bit. So what is important to realize is it's not just a chronoplane issue. Many of them also have broken bottom. Many of them also will have some external tibial torsion associated with it. And some of them will go on to develop what is called translational talus instability or TTI. So if you look at the x-ray here on the image to the right side of the screen, which is the one that I'm pointing to right now. We have a mild ankle valgus deformity. The fibula is a little bit short. You can see the growth plate is not quite at the right level. So mild ankle valgus there. But when you look at the left side, you see the increased gapping on the medial side of the ankle. You see a wedge-shaped distal tibial epiphysis, and you see these locking or kissing osteochondromas in the distal tibia and proximal fibula and the fibular shortening that's associated with that. So that is what is dragging that talus over is the locked osteochondromas and the growth differential in between the tibia and the fibula. So the short fibula gives us a lack of the lateral buttress, doesn't support the talus, and then the kissing osteochondromas or locking osteochondromas aggravate the situation. When you look at the risk factors, this is a paper that came out relatively recently, risk factors for ankle valgus as expected are osteochondromas in the distal tibia fibula, odds ratio of four, the fibula being short, again, similar odds ratio. And if you have a lot of proximal fibula involvement, which means that if the neck of the fibula is much wider than the physis, then again, that increases your risk. So basically, if you have extensive fibular involvement. Looking at growth modulation, which is something that we do all the time and we love, it's a simple, easy procedure. It's easy on us, it's easy on the patient. What we do have to realize is the correction is slower in the MHE population as compared to the non-MHE population. And that can be almost a third slower compared to the non-MHE guys. And there's also increased rebound as compared to the non-MHE population once you take the hardware out. So certainly something to keep in mind. The nice thing is you can always do a repeat if there's enough growth remaining, and that should be that. What I do is I do use a fully threaded screw, which makes it easier for us to take out. And if there's significant trucker bottom, then I will cheat that screw a little bit anterior in the medial malleolus to help with connecting the sagittal plane as well. So there's an example. You can see the ankle valgus there, and we'll go over this as well. So there's that kiddo that we showed in the first example. And with the simple ankle valgus, the medial mal screw works very nicely. I usually don't let it overcorrect too much, even though we know that uh, about half of them will rebound, but the other half won't. So again, varus is not great for the ankle either. So we do need to be careful with that. And also, have to look at the proximal alignment because that is going to throw the ankle off as well. Not only that, you also want to look at the subtalar joint and see if there is any fixed subtalar deformity, which then influences what you need to do. So on the right side, there he is, connected out nicely, hardware out, ankle is nice and horizontal by the time he's skeletally mature. On the left side, this is the one with the translational tail of instability. And back in the day, we weren't quite appreciating this quite as much. So I did nothing to these osteochondromas in between the tibia and the fibula. And sure, we've connected the ankle. So the ankle is now horizontal, but you still see that persistent widening of that medial joint space. So that is something that we don't quite know 
how well that temple is going to hold up in the long term. And we've gotten much more aggressive about trying to resect some of these osteochondromas and unlock the tibia and the fibula at the time of the medial male screw placement. And then obviously you need to do some ambulance and dysmosis because you're all the way down. Another approach is what has been described by the group from South Korea, uh, In Ho Choi and uh, Tae Jun Cho, talk about the fibular lengthening for these kids. So again, you can see the translational Taylor instability. What they do is they resect the osteochondromas, which is important, and then they lengthen the fibula. And with an average of 15 millimeters of lengthening of the fibula, they got about five millimeters of fibular descent. So it doesn't mean that the fibula is gonna descend at the same exact um, distance as you actually lengthen. You lose some of that, but you lengthen till the point you restore your lateral buttress, okay? And that seemed to do very well in their population. The um, group from West Palm Beach, Bailey and the Feldman have popularize the use of the short, which is basically shortening and realignment of the distal tibia again with resection of the offending osteochondromas in the distal tib fib area. So I think that is an important piece of the puzzle. Once the skeleton mature, then obviously you have to osteotomize and you will probably need to osteotomize not just the tibia, but also the fibula, even if you go relatively low. So here's an example. You can see there's about 15 degrees of valgus, which we have straightened out, translated it over, and osteotomized the fibula. So now the fibula is much more able to support that talus. And it's a biplanar correction. So you get not just the valgus part, but also the fruca bottom with the osteotomy. And there he is clinically looking better. So as far as the ankle is concerned, the take home message is valgus is quite common and can be progressive. You do have to assess both proximally and distally like you do for most things in orthopedics. And really the translational Taylor instability is the fork in the road. So medial mouse screws early and probably excise the binding osteochondromas at that time. And for TTI, consider fibular lengthening or a short. Last little slide on limb length discrepancy, which can also be seen quite commonly. This is treated with normal LLD principles that we do in pediatric orthopedics. You can have FSUDs or you can lengthen. Um, always remember that if you're doing a lengthening of the tibia, especially, the fibula is gonna get dragged up. So you really need to be careful with that. You might want to capture the fibula, which we did not do here because we had osteotomized the distal tibia but that is certainly something to consider quite strongly in this population. So with that, we will pause and open things up for discussion. Thanks, Mir. That was really lovely and comprehensive. Covered most of the aspects of uh, the complicated osteochondromas, especially causing deviations around the knee and the ankle and impingement around the hip region. Uh, most of us don't really do too much of spine, but it was nice to know that we need to sometimes monitor them. And that's important that you know that when to screen. <clears throat> so let me ask Sandeep Vaidya to present this case. And uh, after that, we'll take some questions. Sandeep? Right. Yeah. So as this case uh, has been shared by yourself, by Sandeep Patwadhan. So I think you have spoken about this problem, osteochondroma of the femur neck, and uh, this is a 14-year-old boy. Obviously, the you know the functional disability is inability to squat, and also there is painful terminal flexion, abduction, and external rotation movements. And this is what the X-ray shows. So, uh, Bihir, uh, in your talk, you said about you know there were some few natural history papers which. Uh, uh, spoke about, you know, natural improvement of the acetabular indices and the hip indices. So which is the point when you consider, you know, that this hip should undergo an intervention? So that's a great question. And for me, it's mostly two things. The biggest thing is symptoms. Because as 
you've shown in this case, many of these kids are pretty symptomatic because they cannot squat, they cannot sit cross-legged, and they start having pain. You know, this kid is a little bit older. I showed you one that was quite young at, you know, seven and a half, then he started having symptoms. So it's not so much the age that forces me to intervene. I prefer to wait as long as we possibly can. But if they're significantly symptomatic, then that is certainly something that does push me towards more aggressive intervention. The other thing that makes me somewhat nervous also is if they are significantly subluxated, right? So oftentimes they have osteochondromas around the lesser troch. As they grow, they will push the hip laterally. Sometimes they actually have osteochondromas inside the joint, which can also lateralize the hip. And we know that a subluxated hip in any age group really is a cause of significant potential long-term damage. So those are my two big kind of indications to intervene, symptoms being the primary one. And then if the hip is significantly lateralized, then those are ones that I will potentially be a little bit more aggressive with. I may not jump in right away, but I certainly am very uh, quick to jump in with those. Second question, just before I go ahead with this case, you spoke about the safe surgical dislocation approach, but uh, you know, uh, is it that you take this approach in all cases or does the site of the osteochondroma, uh, you know, because sometimes we see that the osteochondroma is projecting a bit posterior medially from the, at the level of the lesser trochanter. So in those cases, would you consider taking a medial approach rather than going for the safe surgical dislocation approach? Absolutely, yeah. So it is, so for me, personally, I think the, SSD has become kind of my procedure of choice because the vast majority of what I deal with and what I see is not necessarily isolated calcar osteochondroma. It's usually more circumferential osteochondromas, but occasionally, and we had one probably about two years ago where this is a girl who had just an isolated osteochondroma coming from the lesser troche area, just like you said, posterior medial. And in that situation, we did go using the adductor approach because sometimes, especially if they're distal, then it's really hard to get all the way distal through the SSD. And in that situation, it's probably a better idea to go with more of a medial approach. Okay. Yeah, so certainly that influences your choice. But the majority will probably end up with an SSD. Yeah, but this case definitely would go for an SSD approach. Yes, because you're circumferentially involved, right? So that's yeah. the problem. You can't really address all of that even with an anterior approach. Yeah, so so we'll just see how, you know, Sandeep has tackled this case. And uh, this is, as you said, you know, the safe surgical dislocation approach. This is what he did. Uh, and this is the SSD approach. And here you can see that you, it gives a great circumferential uh, you know, access to the femoral neck and the entire femoral neck osteochondroma has been excised. And uh, these are the multiple pieces. This is refixation of the trochanteric osteotomy. This is pre-op versus post-op. And you can see the functional improvement. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's doctor. beautiful. Yeah. Very, very nicely done. I don't think I could have done it better. That is beautiful. And this is what you need, right? This is what ends up happening. Um, sometimes what is a challenge is even with taking out all of the osteochondromas pretty much all the way around. I think you still have a little bit left on the neck, but uh, on the medial neck, but that is not really causing any trouble. But even when you take those out, they still have limited external rotation. So that's when uh, I will add a the rotational osteotomy to the femur because without that, they still don't quite get this level of squatting, which is very important. Okay. Sir, just a question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What um, are the chances of recurrence of these osteochondroma excisions when done very young? Would you so, do them prophylactically sometimes because a lot of parents are, uh, they are familial, you know, father has it and mm -hmm. it's an inherited trait. Mm 
and uh, they don't want their child to suffer the same consequences they have had so they come early and start demanding surgery would you do it then and what happens if you do it too early so um that's that's actually a very very common clinical scenario and i think that that is something that you know i'll probably address a little bit towards the end of my second talk but the important thing here is i do not do not try and do things prophylactically because the younger you are the higher the risk of recurrence of the osteochondromas especially if you're very near the growth plate there's a chance of growth plate damage because you know early on the osteochondromas are pretty close to the growth plate so i will actively discourage them from doing things prophylactically and half the parents are sensible maybe more than half the parents are sensible some of them will continue to push you and it's usually in my experience it's not so much the parent who actually has the mh it's the spouse that pushes you because the people who actually have the mh realize that it's really not that bad and they can survive and they can do perfectly well and they've obviously gone on to have kids on their own and have a job and do whatever else so that's really what you want to emphasize to the family the other thing and then i'm just going to get into it now uh, but this is a, a very important point that i was going to make at the end of the talk is many of these kids as you go through their life have multiple multiple surgical procedures and many of them end up with almost like a ptsd kind of a situation especially when you start early so as i have gotten older um and you know as i've seen more of this i have gotten way less aggressive with osteochondroma excisions i try and push them off as much as i possibly can and you know the alignment issues are different the alignment needs to be treated and the alignment needs to be treated at the right time with growth modulation as much as you possibly can to minimize morbidity all around but osteochondromas i will push off as much as i possibly can and then try and combine them with the alignment procedures whenever i can thanks Dilinbhai, you had a question. Yeah, uh, Mihir, uh, the question is about uh, uh, many of these swellings are sessile, means they have a broad base. And when we want to remove it from the neck, it's very difficult to differentiate that we are not actually uh, trying to remove the part of the neck because otherwise that will make the neck uh, weaker. So how do you decide on table that this is the... Uh, line from where you are going to remove the exostosis so as far as the hip is concerned i think the nice thing is you have a femoral head and the femoral head you know what your normal proximal femoral offset needs to be so that gives you a very nice guide as to how deep you want to get because you're absolutely right not only are they sessile there are multiple little bumps all over the place and then you really have to almost circumferentially decorticate the neck which is where the stabilization with the plain screws becomes extremely important it's like having an endotroch fracture we never stabilize those with a simple screw or we never leave that be by itself because we know that they're going to fracture right through that right so you have to do what you need to from an excision perspective <laughs> i usually use the femoral head as a nice guide so i can restore my offset and not go too deep and then you know you can certainly get x rays and drop if you needed to but for me it's mostly using the head as a guide okay yeah so me uh, thomas palokaran had uh, has asked a question uh, he has uh, thank you for his talk for your talk and said that uh, how do you assess the antiversion of the head neck especially when you are doing surgical hip dislocation in the lateral position the antiversion and is it possible that you can put a medial epiphyseodesis screw to prevent uh, the valgus as an anticipatory or preventive measure 
So, Thomas, as always, you have some very, very good questions and you're very insightful. Um, it's good to hear from you. Um, I'll take the second question first as about the medial calcar screw as prophylaxis. There is a paper that came out of China recently, I think it was either this year or last year, I can't remember which, where they did put in a screw to help with the valgus deformity. And they found that it seems to work reasonably well. My challenge is twofold. One is I don't know how many of these will end up with valgus that is problematic. And two is if you look at the growth of the proximal femur, and we're learning more and more about these screw epiphysiodeses with our CP guys, is most of that growth is done by about six or seven. So beyond that, the screw really doesn't seem to do a whole lot, at least in the neuromuscular population. And uh, with not knowing how many of them are gonna have symptomatic valgus issues, um, I am a little bit hesitant in prophylactically putting a screw in the femoral neck, uh, unless you know, you're already there for something. And if you want to do it, that's different. But I would be somewhat cautious. And those screws are not without their challenges because then you end up growing off the screw and then you have to revise it and then you're kind of chasing your own tail. So it's a good concept and there seems to be some literature that's coming out. I'm not quite on the bandwagon just yet. And then the other question was, how do you judge the antiversion? Um, we typically will do that a little bit ahead of time and um, you know, get a sense of preoperatively, get a sense of how much antiversion we have and then we rotate accordingly. So if I know that that is someone that I'm gonna have to do a uh, derotation for, you know, you can still, you can certainly get your imaging pre-op like a CT version study or something else of that sort. Um, and then if you don't, then intraoperatively, you can still get a sense based on your knee axis and your screws up the femoral neck, right? So that still gives you a reasonable, not terribly accurate, but a reasonably accurate sense of how much antiversion you have and how much you want to correct, just like we do for the CT VDROs or whatever else, even though those are done more so in supine position, but you can still get a sense of the version there. Vijay, you have a question. You're muted, bud. Still muted. Okay, Vijay, what we can do is like, uh, you can write in the chat box. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. yeah, please. Okay, uh, Meher, you have a large series of cases. How much, how many of these, have you seen malignant transformation? How many have you seen and is there a predilection between upper limb and lower limb? Is there any difference in the rates of malignant transformation? So, uh, great question. Hold that thought. We'll talk about it in the next part. Okay. okay. Before we move on to the next one, Dharan Bhai, I want to make a quick comment. Going back to Sandeep's first comment about most of us don't do spine. And I don't do spine usually by myself either. Unless there's a tumor, I will do it. And I will do it with one of my spine colleagues. Um, but the important thing here is these are the kids that we are seeing consistently. And it becomes even more important for us to pick up these changes and then send it over to our spine friends or do it with your spine friends or whatever else, because otherwise nobody's going to check those and you end up with major issues, including, you know, quadriplegia and death. So I think we have to take ownership of that part and then bring in our friends as needed for the spine. Okay, that's yeah. very important. Yeah, that's the message we uh, take home that uh, we need to look for the neurology because if we don't, then no one is really look for that. <laughs> yeah. uh, shall we go to the second presentation and then we can take uh, one case for the discussion? Absolutely. Let me share screen again.
Okay, so this one is going to be a little bit shorter than the lower extremity. So we'll talk about the upper limb. And, you know, we have involvement from the clavicle down to the fingertips with MHE. We'll go over some of these, and I'll just give you some practical things that I find useful. And hopefully, you know, we'll have more time for discussion. So a scapula, you can have involvement either on the dorsal or on the ventral surface. The ones that are on the dorsal surface are much easier. You oftentimes have them on the spine of the scapula and they can cause trouble with, you know, rubbing against backpacks and things like that. And if they cause trouble, we take them out. If they don't, we don't fuss with them. The ones that are on the ventral surface or on the thoracic surface of the scapula can rub against the ribs and cause significant pain, crepitus, and scapulothoracic uh, dyskinesia. And those are the ones that we end up, uh, again, having to take care of with the approaches being somewhat more um, extensile. And you can either, if it's more on the medial side, you can go in right on the uh, vertebral border of the scapula. If it's on the lateral side, then you go in from the lateral side and lift the scapula up. You just have to be careful of the neurovascular structures in the area. So the dorsal scapula, suprascapula on the medial side and the long thoracic and other things on the lateral side. What I find quite useful in preoperative planning for these is a CT. MRIs are nice. They show you, you know, the other soft tissue elements and all of that. But to me, a 3D CT really gives me a sense of where things are and how do I best approach those. So here's a little bit of an unusual situation. You have an osteochondroma arising from the coracoid. It's indenting the clavicle, as you can see, and then there's the plexus right on it. So just having a sense of where that base is gives me a little bit of a better idea as to how do I best approach it and take it out safely. And there's a more standard situation where you have a, an osteochondroma on the vertebral border going towards the ribs, causing irritation. So 3D CTs have been quite useful in this situation as far as my practice goes. Proximal humeral involvement, clavicular involvement, common, but not usually terribly symptomatic. And approaches are usually the standard delta pectoral for the most part. Occasionally, if it's a medial posterior medial, then you may have to do more of an axillary dissection and dissect out the neurovascular bundle. And again, uh, I'm quite likely to use neuromonitoring even in the upper extremities if there's major neurovascular dissection that I need to perform. And that has worked out well. Now, this is kind of the crux of the MHE upper extremity, which is the MHE forearm. There's nothing that is more controversial and less clarified than the MHE forearm. Forearm involvement is quite common. Four out of five kids will have it. Forearm deformity is at least in half, maybe more. And radial head dislocations, which are quite disabling in about 20 to 30% of these kids. These can result in significant pain and limited rotation, some of which is compensated by the shoulder. So rotations are fortunately not as much of an issue, but they certainly can be quite limited. And the shoulder can compensate some, but sometimes they're so limited that it becomes more of a functional problem. Traditionally, We've classified them using the Masada classification, which was published way back in 1989. And we'll go over some of the limitations of those as well. So like I said, radio head dislocation is the crux of the matter. Do we know what the risk factors are and how do we treat this? And is there any kind of prophylactic thing that we can do? Classifications, is Masada the only classification? Is it the best classification? Does it really help us in any way? And when you do embark upon surgery, what are the principles and how much do we actually benefit people? So this is probably one of the best reviews that we've had on MHE. This is out of uh, the UK, I think, and this is 212 non-operated forums in kids who are skeletally mature, really more than 15 years of age. Half EXT1, half EXT2. So there is some thought that the EXT2 leads to more forearm involvement. I don't know that that's 100% uh, 
uh, true or established, but there is some thought to that. And uh, going to Vijay's question about chondrosarcomas in this particular series, they had more, um, you know, upper extremity chondrosarcomas, so two scapular, one proximal humerus, two spines, one rib, one pelvis. Um, I don't know that, again, this is truly representative of all of them, but this is a large series. Most of them had forearm involvement and on average had three exostoses per forearm and one out of seven had a dislocated radial head. Rotational arc was significantly limited in those with a dislocated radial head versus not as is expected. And when they looked at what their risk factors were, they found that it's mainly the ulnar length. So if the proportional ulnar length to height is less than 12 or 13%, then that was predictive in their series. And there are a couple other series that have come up with similar numbers um, as far as the risk of radial head dislocation is concerned. So I think this is a useful thing for us to kind of take away. Um, I know that in a busy orthopedic practice, not everybody is getting heights on these patients, but it may well be worth doing that. We do it routinely because that's what we are mandated to do. So we do have height data on all of these kids, but that is something to consider, uh, especially if you find that there is some degree of forearm involvement, it may be a good idea to measure the heights. Uh, traditional Masada classification, type one is distal ulna, type two is with a radial head dislocation, either distal ulna and proximal radius, which is 2A, or just the distal ulna, which is 2B, and then type three is distal radial involvement. This to me is a little bit haphazard and kind of all over the place, as far as classifications go, there's not really any systematic thought to this. And this is based on only 30 patients. There are no patients that had any distal, radial, or ulnar involvement that are mentioned in this particular classification, so it becomes hard. So almost a third, maybe a little bit more than a third, are then considered unclassifiable as we go forward and look at our patients. And there's a recent paper that just came out earlier this year about the inter-intrograder reliability of the Masada, and they found that this was quite poor. So the folks from South Korea came up with their own modification because they realized that this is these are the problems with the Masada. And they added a type four, which is both bone distal involvement. And also, again, when they looked at the radial head dislocation risk, they found that if you have significant ulnar shortening compared to the radius, you're at 18 times the risk of a radial head dislocation. And also if you have an increased radial bow, then again, you're at higher risk. So these are things, again, that we can kind of keep at the back of our mind if there's significant discrepancy. So traditional indications for surgery for pain, increased radial inclination with progressive carpal slip, decreasing range of motion, and then obviously radial head instability. However, when you look at the longer term results, and this is from Masada's group um, in Japan, they had about a 13 or 14 year follow-up, and they found that the only ones that really had any major improvement were the ones where the osteochondromas were painful and they took them out and not necessarily improving their function in any way, shape or form. So that is something that is quite sobering because we love to operate, we are surgeons, that's what we do. But we do have to have a sense of whether or not we're actually helping people or not. So we need to have good long-term functional data. So here's, we go through a few cases. This is a simple little thing. You know, you have an isolated distal osteochondroma, distal radius looks fine. There's no difference in the radial ulnar variance that looks good, no carpal slip, easy, do nothing right? Just because there's an osteochondroma doesn't mean it needs to come out. Here's a slightly more involved case. So this is someone who at, at age eight, you can see has a short ulna. There are osteochondromas in both the distal radius and the distal ulna. The range of motion was okay and the ulna shortening wasn't too bad. There wasn't really any significant increase in the bow. So we watched it. And at five and a half years or five years and three month follow-up, here we are. So you can see that the ulna has progressively shortened over time. And what I would love, love, love for you to kind of get a little bit of appreciation of is when you look at the physis 
you want to look at the proximal and the distal radial physis. And if you see that physis kind of triangulating just like the fibula does, then that means that usually there is a bit of a tether down distally. And those are the ones obviously that will have the carpal slip, but those are the ones that very infrequently have a radial head dislocation, okay? So, and you don't necessarily see that right off the bat. You can see maybe a little bit of a triangulation here, but as you follow them along, if you see dysmorphic changes in the distal physis, then it is less likely that we will end up with radial head instability, but they do need to be followed. So here we are. She's symptomatic at that point. What we did was we took out the locking osteochondromas and then shortened and straightened out the radius. So this is like a short procedure for the tibia just in reverse. And you know, the distal radius is very much like the distal tibia in that regard. Now, here's another example. So again, you see that same kind of dysmorphic appearing distal radial physis there. You see the carpal slip. You see the ulna is pretty straight. And you also see the dysmorphic changes in the distal ulna as well. So you don't really have a nice flat ulnar surface. So when if you decide to correct the discrepancy in length in between the two, you probably still need to leave that ulna a little bit short. Otherwise, you end up with a sharp ulna jabbing into the carpus. So again, here's what we did. You can see the degree of shortening and angular correction, temporarily stabilized with the wires to hold it in place. And then there's a plate and screws. And because of the dysmorphic nature of the physis, I added a radial styloid screw, much like a medial mouth screw. And here we are. So there she is at about 14 and a bit. All healed, the ulna is still a little bit short, but the radius is now much flatter and much happier. And you can see there's a little bit of a bow to the distal ulna. But overall, radial head remains stable. And there's her function. So almost full pronation, almost full supination, and great wrist function. Now this is a little bit more of a challenge. So this is someone that we started off with a while ago. And you can see clearly there's a dislocated radial head there. Reasonably good elbow motion, but really poor rotation. So here we are at age eight. You can see a large ulnar osteochondroma. You can see the radial bow, and you can already see that the radial head is dislocated. CT, again, is quite useful. You can get an MR as well. And you can see the osteochondroma here. If you look at the distal radius there, it really isn't dented quite as much or tilted quite as much, but that is something for you to kind of keep an eye on as well. So now, what you also don't see very clearly, and this is something that we've slowly kind of realized over time, is as these kids dislocate their radius, not only is it a radial dislocation, but when it's this early, look at what's happening to the sigmoid notch. That notch is not normal anymore. That notch has progressively, as the radial head dislocates, it's almost like acetabular dysplasia with progressive migration, you end up widening that notch. So even when you bring the head back down, it's not going to be a normal head. The other thing you also want to look at is what is the shape of that radial head? If it's already convex, putting it back in is not helping anybody. So those are things that we will look for and look at as we plan our reconstructive strategy. The other thing that we've also realized over time is not only do you have dysplasia in the proximal ulna, but there's also typically a significant angular deformity in the proximal radius, which usually is seen as valgus on your radiographs, but it's a multiplanar deformity. And as we've done more CAT scans than these, we've learned to appreciate that more. I don't know that I have the best surgical strategy for those just yet. So this was back in the day, we lengthened it with an X-fix 
excised the osteochondroma and then did an ulnar lengthening because we wanted to bring the radial head down. We incorporated the radius into the frame. You can do this with a uniplanar X-fix. You can do this with a circular X-fix, whatever your level of comfort and experience is. You also have to do a little bit of angulation. It's like a montage, right? So you really have to do a little bit of angulation to be able to get the right alignment for the ulna. So that's something to keep in mind as well. And then as we lengthened, we brought the radius down. Once the radius is slightly over reduced is when you take the radial frame off and then just proceed with ulna lengthening. Because he was eight, we did attempt to over lengthen the ulna. The ulna is not super dysplastic. There's all sorts of cartilage that's there still. So you can afford to over lengthen it slightly. You don't want to super over lengthen because then you will end up with ulnar carpal abutment and tape. And then you follow him along and here he is at four years first stop, back out, same thing, same problem. So that's the question again, related to part of what Dr. Patwardhan was talking about is, you know, if you do them prophylactically, what happens? This is not prophylactic, but you still will end up with trouble as you go along. So this is what I was talking about. You see the radial shaft alignment, and then you see the alignment at the neck. So there's a proximal radial deformity in these patients. So there he is again, you can see this is all from the prior surgery and the realignment and everything else. And this time around, we used a materialized protocol to come up with custom jigs to see if we could do something to get that head in a better position. So as you can see, these are extensile approaches, lots of exposure here. And you can see it's a multi-planar wedge really. And these are pre-drilled uh, screws from the jig, and you can cut through the jig as well and take out a predetermined amount of bone. And not only do you do that in the ulna, you also then have to address the radial deformity. So it's really a huge, big surgical exposure. And this is what we end up with, understanding that your sigmoid notch is still not normal. So this gets you back towards normal, but not quite normal. And some people would say, why even bother? Just take off the radial head and be done with it. And I think that is certainly an approach that can be considered, right? Um, the type 2A masadas, the ones that have distal osteochondromas and proximal radial osteochondromas and proximal radial deformity, again, remain quite challenging. And this one presented late, he was about 12 or 13. You can see the deformity is there. You can see that the top of the radius is certainly not normal looking. And this is one that we decided not to address because I don't think that there was anything that I could have done that would have given him any major functional improvement. If that radial head becomes more symptomatic over time, certainly would consider excising that radial head, but I don't know that I can significantly improve his forearm arc with my interventions. So it's okay to say, listen, I can make things more difficult for you, but in this situation, you're probably better off with no surgery at all. So as far as the treatment options for the forearm are concerned, excision of the offending osteochondroma is correcting the bows, correcting the length differential in between the radius and the ulna, if you're doing an ulnar lengthening, certainly consider bringing the radius down when you have a radial head dislocation. You may need to do a, an open reduction of the radial head, and you may need to add a proximal radial osteotomy. We're exploring the role of growth modulation, just like we do with the tibia. I think we've started using it a little bit more for some of the kids with the more dysplastic distal radial physis. And once things are corrected, we can certainly take those screws out as well. So lots of different choices and you know, lots of different classifications, not anything that really helps me. So this is the way I think about it. I think about, is this primarily a distal ulnar osteochondroma problem? 
So is it an isolated distal ulnar osteochondroma with a radial tilt? Uh, with an ulnar tilt, I'm sorry, and a carpal slip? If that's the case, take out the osteochondroma and either do a corrective radial osteotomy or a screw. Again, if symptomatic. If that is associated with a radial head dislocation, then you do everything up front with the excision on the lengthening plus minus the annular ligament and the radial corrective osteotomy. If it's primarily a distal radial issue, and if it's isolated, again, if it's symptomatic, take it out. If not, leave it alone. If you have issues with the joint. So again, you're seeing that theme here. Isolated, joint issue. Isolated, joint issue. Then you address the differential and excise the offending osteochondroma. And then for me, if both bones are significantly involved, like distal radial on the locking osteochondromas that have limited pronation supination, I will certainly go ahead and try and excise those. And that will help with some improvement. Doesn't always normalize them, especially if you do them early, they do grow back and cause things to lock up again. So certainly something to be aware of and be careful about. If it is a distal ulna with a proximal radius, which is similar to the Masada 2A, then I don't know that I have the best choice, especially if they are late. And I don't know that I can make any major improvements to their function. So from a take home message perspective, we really need better long-term data and uh, patient reported outcomes. And we know the ones that will dislocate the radial heads. There are some of the risk factors that we look out for. Maybe there will be a role for some prophylactic management of those. I don't do that just yet. Um, if you are lengthening the ulna, make sure you include the radius. Look out for recurrences if you do them early. And the dysmorphic changes, both proximally and distally, are going to affect your results. So look out for those and be careful of what you promise your patients. Um, MHE hand, what is different? Distal phalanx involvement is quite common. You can get nail deformities. Unlike regular osteochondromas, these actually grow towards the joint as opposed to away from the joint, and they can cause significant limitation in range of motion. And pain is quite uncommon. They have, you know, many of them will have finger involvement. Not many of them will complain about it, but angular deformities and decreased range of motion may need to be addressed. So there's an example. This is a very young child. He was only about four, three or four uh, when we started. And you can see there's already a big osteochondroma blocking his flexion. So we did excise that. And you do want to be careful with the growth plate there, right? Because as you go through that, you may end up with a growth arrest and that will cause its own issues. So you do have to be a little bit careful with that. And there he is looking much more normal and functioning well. Last thing, malignant transformation. So if there's an example, a 48 year old with MHE, buttock pain, enlarging mass. You can see all the calcification in that cartilage cap around the SI joint. You can see the SI joint involvement and extension out into the soft tissues. These are hard. This is the longest case that I've ever done in my life. And, you know, we did an anterior vascular dissection, went in from the back, sacral laminectomy is a hemisacrectomy, partial hemipelvectomy, dissect out the entire plexus, so vessels in the front, plexus, take the tumor out, bridge. So there's the graft from five to supraacetabular, and then uh, put a flap on over top. These are tough cases, but there she is doing well. Yeah. So rate of malignant transformation, roughly about four to 5%. I don't know that there is any literature out there that says the upper extremity is more involved or the lower extremity is more involved. It's mostly the axial skeleton. And the ext ones are roughly twice as likely to develop malignant transformation. So there's another relatively large study and you see more involvement of the lowers as compared to the uppers. And then we also saw the other paper that had more upper extremity involvement. So it's roughly, I would say probably the pelvis in my experience is probably the most annoying and the most likely. All right, so I'm gonna stop there with this because I do want to leave some time for discussion. Um, 
last few words, genetics matters. Counseling is extremely important. And like uh, we were talking about with Sandeep, emphasize function. That really is the key. You really don't care about, or you really don't want the patient to care about the appearance or the osteochondromas in themselves. You really want to emphasize how functional they are, show them how functional their parents are, and provide them with psychologic support because they do get bullied, they do get teased, and they, because of our interventions, can end up with a PTSD-like situation. So try and minimize interventions, use the Semmel's principle, do as many things as you can at one time. And important thing is to maintain good alignment at maturity and minimize arthritis and monitor them for secondary malignancy. Thank you. It's a lot. Yeah. Um, like you covered the whole topic completely. And so it was a very good revision of every important point related to exostosis. Yes, yeah, Sandeep, can you take your case? Because what you are going to show is, is very different than what Mahir spoke. So... Yeah. Yeah, so this is a case which uh, myself and Mandar had managed some 10 years ago. And uh, he presented to us like this, a 16-year-old male, known case of hereditary multiple exostosis with uh, a bony projection jutting out from the elbow since early childhood and which has progressively worsened since the past three years. As you can see, so there is a palpable osteochondroma on the distal ulna. And the dislocated radial head is, you know, there is a proximal overgrowth of almost four to five centimeter and there is tenderness at its tip. Mm. This is his function. He has a, almost zero to 130 flexion and the pronosupination is restricted, 30 supination to 20 pronation. And uh, this is the X-ray picture. So, you know, I would like to take your inputs, you know, how would you go about managing a case of this severity? And uh, I will say congratulations to him for not <laughs> having it open to the air by now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, this is ridiculous. I think I've seen this uh, case previously, but you know, these are crazy cases, right? And this is what you see with MHG sometimes, especially if they don't come in. And what can you do in this situation? You really can't do a whole lot. You just have to, at this point, say, okay, we don't want your skin to break down and we're going to try and remove as much as we can off your proximal radius. And <clears throat> you'll be surprised sometimes as to what kind of function they end up with. Okay. So you would just, you know, knock off probably the projecting proximal radius. You probably have to go a little bit below that. Yeah. You have to do a proximal radial excision. Okay. So probably, you know, this was 10 years ago and, uh, we were pretty aggressive at that point of time. So this is obviously a very severe uh, 2B uh, type of deformity. What uh, we decided to do at that point of time is a one mode form. Uh, I don't know whether you would agree to that line of management. These are a few radiological parameters. And uh, this is how we went about it. So this was what was done. Yeah. So an extensile approach with protection of the posterior interosseous nerve and uh, excision of the proximal radius and distal ulna. And uh, the, uh, as in a single bone forearm, the ulna was then anastomosed to the distal radius and this was fixed with a nail. Uh, would you agree with this line of management, Meer? So my question- or do you feel you... it's a bit aggressive? Uh, you know, so certainly if you have a tumor situation, as in a malignant tumor or even a GCT type situation where you have a benign aggressive lesion, uh, we've done these, right? Yep. And they work and they work pretty well. The question becomes in a situation where you're completely looking at something benign, what is the fate of the risk in the long term going to be with this. So certainly doable and it looks nice. And I'm sure that his function is pretty decent as well. But I would worry a little bit about what long-term long -term consequences are going to be. 
So anyway, at this point of time, uh, this was fixed with a nail. And uh, sometime later, he actually went into a non union at the, you know, the, uh, mm -hmm. the osteotomy site. So this was then, you know, replaced with a plate and which went on to heal quite well. And uh, this was the function at 1.5 years. And uh, this was the function at six years. So he seems to be doing quite okay. But as you said, you know, we need to look at the long run, you know, what happens in, you know, late adult life that also needs to be looked at in cases of the single bone forearm. Uh, surprisingly, you know, even in single bone forearm, they maintain quite a good range of prolosupination because of the compensatory, you know, uh, carporadial uh, uh, hypermobility. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, no, it, it works. You know, it, it definitely works. There's no question yeah. about it. It's not so interesting. If you look at your x-rays, you almost have reformation of that proximal radius yeah. with the ossification there. So when you take those out, you know, you really want to make sure your extra periosteal can still protect the nerve at the same time, which is not always fun. So yeah. these are tough cases, but nice. Yeah, this is a good result for him and uh, he's probably quite happy with it, at least for now. So, you know, so this is a very late presenting case, but, you know, just a uh, child who presents very early with a distal ulna, you know, exostosis, okay, without any radial bowing or you know, any impending radial head dislocation. Uh, there was a 2020 paper which talked about, you know, early excision in prepubescent children because they, but, but it was a very small series, I think only about seven or eight children where they showed that, you know, it may, might help in, you know, decreasing the later consequences. Do you agree with that view or you are, you know, experience has been different? So again, I have gotten way less aggressive as time has gone on uh, with my MHG kids. Um, the challenge as you've kind of alluded to is you have all these little series with very short follow-ups that say, yes, I think this is gonna happen. And yes, I think that is gonna happen. And uh, I don't know that we have any decent data to really hang our hats on. I think to me, there was an old paper by Paul Mansky and then the paper from Masada's group that have the longer term follow-ups that are very sobering because we really don't seem to make as much of a difference as we think we do and certainly as we would like to. So for me, if you are significantly off from a you know, proportional ulnar length perspective, then that might be something that I would consider as far as excision of the osteochondroma from the ulna is concerned. Um, but I rarely do anything that is super prophylactic anymore. Okay. Uh, like say we have, uh, we are already overshooting the time, but like we will take one question. Uh, Dr. Premal Nayak has asked a question that is there any role of distal ulna release to prevent radial head excision as Malibeth Izaki has suggested. Um, I don't know. <laughs> That's my short answer to that question is I really don't know. I don't do it routinely. So I really cannot give you any kind of useful information there. Meher, okay. when you lengthen the ulna, do you routinely over lengthen it? Or do you go to the third? When do you know when to stop? I had a case where I've shown a little over lengthening and then over time, it just goes back to, you know, it comes back to its normal, this thing. So I actually over lengthened it. I had the case, but there's no time to show it. And then in follow up, it just goes back. You know, the radius again comes in front and it does. Yeah. The same thing happened with the Mihir's case. Yeah. Yeah, it does. And, uh, you know, it's not an exact science as you know, Vijay, uh, the, growth rates in the upper extremity are not all that well defined and certainly with mhe they're certainly not well defined at all so depending on the age if they're significantly young so you know 10 or less then i will routinely over lengthen um, if they're closer to maturity then i'm much less aggressive I, i'm happy to take a little bit of ulna shortening if i have to what is the maximum ulna lengthening that you do I think in the case that I showed you, it, it depends again on the regenerate. 
right? So it depends on the age, it depends on other things, but it really depends on the quality of the regenerate. We bring them back in once a week, once every other week to check and see how well the regenerate is doing. And uh, you can lengthen them. Uh, the ulna is very slow to heal as compared to, you know, your standard lower extremity bones. So you do need to keep them in an X-fix for a longer period of time. And I will routinely cast them once the X-fix comes off for a decent period of time as well and protect them in some sort of forearm brace for a while because you don't want to leave them casted for too long either because then you end up losing your pronation supination. So it really depends on the age and how well the lengthening is going and also you know how, how much over lengthening you've gotten into. So yeah. Peter Waters described his technique, I mean, uh, what you do, you know, the radial shortening and the same wedge about one centimeter, you insert it back into the ulna. So that effectively corrects about, you know, two centimeter of ulna variance acutely on table. So Yeah, that's uh, to me that, so the radial shortening is a very nice procedure. And I think it's happier for the patients. It's happier for the surgeon. Um, the acute centimeter of ulnar lengthening is certainly doable. It's a bit of a stretch, but it definitely is doable. And if you have that much of a difference and you want to do that acutely, I think that's a very, very reasonable thing to do. So uh, thank you very much, Mihir, Vijay, and Sandeep for excellent deliberation. And I, I know that this is a topic where we can continue discussing for hours together because there are so many questions which are still unanswered. But uh, thank you once again for sharing your knowledge and have a great day ahead. Thank you once again on behalf of Aussie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate being with you guys and I hope to see you guys soon in Bhubaneswar. Right? Bye. Yeah. Bye.